بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. Uh, the topic is political اجتهاد. I try my best to be brief because of my voice problem. And I will give you more time to not to ask but to comment. I prefer comments than questions today, so for pragmatic reasons. <coughs> Uh, I want to start with these quotations from my uh, favorite poet, and philosopher, Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, uh, he wrote in his memoir or book of reflection that's titled Stray Reflections. He said, the powerful man creates environment. The feeble have to adjust themselves to it. This is the idea of creation and adaptation as a theme of this summer school. So I think this is probably one of the uh, uh, best description of this equation. Well, when we talk about Islam and politics, we need to go back to the core values. Is justice more important or mercy in Islam, for example? Is Islam a religion of justice or a religion of mercy if you have to choose, if you have to go to the core values? Ibn Taymiyyah, in his uh, debate with some Christian theologians, if, if I remember in his letter to people of uh, Cyprus, he said that Islam is a combination of al-vadl, Well, bounty and justice. He was debating with a Christian theologian who said, well, our religion is the one of mercy and bounty of God. Uh, the religion, Judaism is the religion of justice, legalism. So why there is need for a new religion in the first place? And Ibn Taymiyyah replied, we need the third religion to be a combination of both, of of mercy and justice, of al-vadl wa al-adl. But for my friend Iqbal, who is sometimes, he used the exaggerations of poets, uh, he said that God reveals himself in history more as a power than love. So uh, what, for Iqbal, he wants to emphasize justice more than mercy. Justice probably, mercy as an individualistic I thought that's fine, but if you want to build a social order, there is need for justice more than anything else. And he said justice is an inestimable treasure, but we must guard it against the thief of mercy. The thief of mercy. I think, yeah, there might be some exaggeration here, but if you put it within the Islamic uh, moral philosophy, we can get it right. For example, forgiveness in Islamic morality is a great virtue in individual right, not in collective right. In your personal right, you are urged to forgive. But if you are a leader of a country, for example, other people come and, and uh, attack your country, say, so, uh, let's be nice people and just uh, forgive them. No, that's not your responsibility because it's not your right here. The collective right, justice is more important than, than forgiveness and mercy. And in Surah Al-Shura, we have uh, an, uh, some, uh, uh, some scholars at, at least interpret a few verses in Surah Al-Shura in this meaning. They said that sabr, or patience and forgiveness, was mentioned in the Surah in a singular form. And taking your right or establishing justice is, is presented in plural form in this surah. Here the verb is for singular. But when you come to the other side, collective right, Allah is usually praising believer that if they are oppressed, They resist oppression. They fight back as a collective entity. 
Uh, Ali Izzet Begovic presented this idea or this, this equation of justice and mercy, but uh, in another terminology, which is realism and idealism. He wrote in his book, Islam Between East and West, that Islam is a combination of realism of the Old Testament and the idealism of the New Testament. It's a combination of this and that. It's, uh, morality and practical politics at the same time. And then he said, in order for religion to impact the world, it needs to be worldly. If religion is disconnected from the reality of people, it cannot impact the reality of people. And, uh, and uh, when he, he, did, he did some kind of survey toward religion, and he said, the most, the most vital religions today are two. Islam and Christian Protestantism. And they said one of the reasons for that is they are worldly religion. Diana Dunyawiya in, in the Arabic translation. I mean, they are not isolated or disconnected from the reality of people. Uh, again, another uh, comparison between the birth of Islam and the birth of Christianity. You see here the difference in the political term. Christianity was born within an established political order, which is the, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was ruling the whole Mediterranean, including Palestine, where Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was born. So when Jesus started his mission, he started within a context of an established political order. He doesn't need to build a state. There is a state. He doesn't need to bring a law. There is a law. Well, Islam, even from a historical perspective, regardless of belief, was born in a completely different context, in a political vacuum and legal vacuum in Arabia, because in Arabia there was no established political order when the Prophet ﷺ started his mission. And there is no law. He has to build his own state, and he has to present his, in his own law. And that's what Iqbal is, uh, is uh, explaining in his book, Reconstruction of the Islamic Religious Thought, when he said that primitive Christianity was founded not as a political or civil unit, but as a monastic order in a profane world, having nothing to do with the civil affairs and obeying the Roman authority practically in all matters. The result of this was that when the state became Christians, state and church confronted each other as distinct powers with interminable boundaries, boundary disputes between them. Such a thing could never happen in Islam, for Islam was from the very beginning a civil society, means a political entity from the beginning. Uh, Yes, Islam actually revolutionized the human thought on politics. And it's not just Muslim apologists who are saying that. There are Western scholars who study Islam political thought who are saying basically this also. Uh, Anthony Block, in his History of Islamic Political Thought, for example, said that the foundation of Islam was a decisive break in the human thinking about politics and society. At the heart of the project was the transfer of power from empire to prophet and later to religious community. Islam transferred the political authority from the emperor to the prophet and then from the prophet to the community. So, and this is a huge transformation in a human political thought and practice. It's a huge transformation. But unfortunately, the richness of Islamic texts in political values were not translated into richness in Muslim culture in terms of institutions and procedures. I need to fix some thing here that
to be sure we got the translation right. Sorry for that. I want to mention here a few core political values in Islam, about 20 of them, just to show example of this richness in political values. And then to show later, unfortunately, how poor Islamic culture is in procedure, political procedures and political institutions. The first is Tawheed itself. Monotheism, but I'm using it here in the political sense. Political monotheism means monotheism itself has its political implication. Of course, this is not only in Islam, but in all political, in all monotheistic religions. That if you make God the center, so the ruler is no longer the center of the world. In in non-monotheistic religions or cultures, till recently, there are some people who are making sujood for the emperor of Japan, for example. You, you cannot find this kind of, of behavior in Islamic, in Islamic history or Islamic culture with all of the despotism that happened in Islamic history, but the ruler was never sacred or treated as a sacred person or a sacred subject. That is one of the influences and the implication of Tawheed. And one of the results of that is rejection of this, of what I would like to call in Arabic or political paganism. So the ruler was never worshipped in Islamic culture. Yes, there are some people who are submissive to the ruler, but they never look at, at the ruler as in a, a sacred object. The third principle is الرد إلى الله والرسول in, in Quran that if you have dispute about something if there is dispute between rulers and rules refer it to Allah and his messenger. And this is very important, this is reference. You can have the best political system in the world but if it's not based on referring issues to Allah and his messenger it cannot be called Islamic political system. I mean, you can have democracy in all Muslim countries without being Islamic political system. Unless you have this principle of الرد إلى الله والرسول. And then you have freedom, which is um, William James, when he wrote his book on psychology, he said this is a new term for an old idea. So, f of course, freedom as a political term is new, but the content of freedom, the moral content of freedom, is not new in a human culture. And in, in Islamic legacy, there are some terms used like الإباحة الأصلية, like براءة الذمة. It's all give the, the meaning of that. People have the right to do whatever they like to do, as long as it's not prohibited in the text or it's not harming others. So the principle is there even if they, if they didn't use the, the term Hurriya. Al-Qiyam bil-Qist or establishing justice is presented in the Holy Quran as actually the most important part of the mission of all prophets of God and all messages that were sent from God. We read in Surah Al-Hadid, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلُنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسِ بِالْقِسْطِ God sent down revelations and he sent prophets for one purpose, which is that a human being established, should establish uh, justice. One of the core political values of Islam is Luzum al Jama'ul, collectivity. In, to be a part of a social body. Islam creates that kind of social body. From the beginning, when the Prophet came to Medina, he announced brotherhood between Muhajirin and Ansar. He created a new community above the tribal affiliation that the Arabian people 
uh, used to have. And then you have al ijma or al ijtima if you use the the term that is literally used in the hadith. La tajtami'u ummati ala dalala. And al ijma basically means consensus, means also majority rule, because in some hadith related to ijma, talking about sawad al a'lam or the majority. That if the issue is not explicitly in the text, it's about personal opinion, public interest, the majority need to be followed by the minority on that, as long as it doesn't hurt the other side. A shura, which is the source of political legitimacy in Islam, is a very important principle. And al-mushawara, which is related to decision-making, that decision-making should be done collectively. A ruler, even if he's a legitimate ruler, doesn't mean that he can make decision on his own. He needs to make decision along with people. He needs to make it collective. بالأمر. And we have the concept of al-amana, which in Islamic political terminology means that political position itself is a trust. It's not a personal property that you inherited from your father or mother or something that you just got by force. No. Political position is a trust. It's a mana. Prophet ﷺ told Abu Dhar, إِنَّكَ ضَعِيف وَإِنَّهَا أَمَانَ One of his companions, Abu Dhar, asked him to appoint him in a political position. He said, no, you are a weak person and this is a trust. إِنَّكَ ضَعِيف وَإِنَّهَا أَمَانَ <clears throat> Another concept is al-quwa. The term al-quwa in Islamic political terminology means simply competence. Al-quwa for a diplomat is his, his diplomatic skills. For a military leader, is his military uh, skills, for etc. So, uh, Competence is very important. It's not enough to be a good Muslim who fear God, but you have to be competent also to be in charge of people's affairs. And obedience, obeying legitimate leadership is very important, especially when we remember the socio-historical context in which Islam was revealed the first time. That's in Arabia. The Arabs didn't have the tradition of states and governments and laws and uh, they didn't like even to submit themselves to any kind of authority they proud themselves they pride themselves for for uh, refusing to obey anybody for killing their rulers for taking them captives you know you find this plenty in political in uh, in arabic uh, poetry pre-islamic arabic poetry one of them said, من عهد عاد كان معروفا لنا أسر الملوك وقتلها وقتالها. Since the time of Aad, Aad, you know those old uh, Arabs that mentioned in the Holy Quran in the, the uh, story of Prophethood. Since the time of Aad, he said, we are known of killing, fighting our rulers and capturing them and killing them. He's priding himself for doing that. So in this kind of culture, obedience of legitimate leaders is very important and it is emphasized in many hadith of Prophet ﷺ. Another core value in Islam, uh, core political value is al-mudafa'a, which is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah and in Surah Al-Hajj. وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لَفَسَّدَتِ الْأَرْضِ Has God not make some people check others and stop them. Uh, so corruption will spread all over the world. al uh, which is the best translation I found for it, is the American terminology term of checks and balances. It's a very important concept in, in Islam. And there is gentleness, but in the political sense, which is mentioned in hadith, many hadith of Prophet also. Of course, gentleness is is good for in any for for everybody in any uh, conditions, but but gentleness as a political term, 
in hadith, like uh, the hadith of Bukhari, for example, Allahumma man waliya min amri ummati shay'an farafaqa bihim farfuq bih. Wa man waliya min amri ummati shay'an fashakka alayhim fashquq alayhim. Prophet is making dua, supplication to Allah. Oh Allah, whoever took a public position uh, or a leadership position, my ummah, and, and he is gentle with them, be gentle with him. And if he is harsh on them, be harsh with him. Uh, and this is very important and, uh, in, in terms of responsibility of rulers to be kind and nice with rules. And we have the uh, 14 concept of Madullah. Public wealth is interestingly called in, in hadith Madullah, the wealth of God or the ownership of God. And this is a very important term because of, it gives this, the, the meaning of sanctity of public wealth. That don't touch it. Be careful. Just like when you say Baytullah for Kaaba. It's not like any other house. It's a house of Allah. So public wealth is called wealth of God in, in hadith. In several hadith of Prophet. Uh, and of course, based on that, we have we find the prohibition of stealing public wealth, which is called Ghulul, uh, and mentioned in Quran Surah Ali Imran. And, and Rashwa, bribery, which is also mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, and we have this concept of Al-Akhd ala zalim that we have in several hadith. Uh, of the Prophet وسلم, which is in our today's language probably the best thing to translate is uh, resisting oppression. You have to stop stopping oppressors. And the Prophet وسلم, said if people don't stop the oppressor then injustice will spread all over the society. General punishment from God will come to any community that doesn't stop the oppression. Uh, and we have the principle of accessibility, which is I could not find any English translation for this, but I translate it by the opposite, which is accessibility, the right of people to to have their public authority accessible, that the ruler have, has no right to isolate himself from people. So they cannot talk to him, they cannot complain, they cannot... No, that, that, is, that is haram in Islam. And Prophet ﷺ was the best example for that. Uh, and finally, uh, that people are discouraged from asking political leadership for presenting themselves and asking, making propaganda, self-promotion for themselves in order to get political position. Uh, okay, let's uh, keep these uh, values aside. It, but before that, actually, if, if anyone, any student of political philosophy uh, and the fundamental or perpetual questions of polit political philosophy, who has the right to rule and what is the relation between rulers and rules, etc., uh, will find these political values great and they, are, they can be the foundation of the best political system. But unfortunately, what we have here is the other side of the story, which is with the Islam richness in political values, we have Muslims' poverty in political procedures and institutions. And this is one of the characteristics of Islamic history, Islamic political history, unfortunately. Classical Muslim scholars do not translate Islamic political values into procedures and institutions. For example, they did not conceptualize jurisprudential details on power transition. 
mean something that is compatible with the values. Of course, they conceptualize many things, but it was adaptive to the coercive power more than based on the value that we just mentioned. They did not develop permanent institutions in charge of managing this risky business, which is a transition, power transition. Power transition is very risky business. Muslims did not develop permanent and stable institution in charge of this. Yes, we read about stories here and there like Omar, for example, appointed or selected six people and he asked them to supervise this process of selecting the next Khalifa and they end up with beautiful process. Uh, they ended up choosing Uthman Radalan. But this committee was not transformed into a permanent established institution that can supervise this very risky transition that happened in Islamic history, including uh, in Khulafa al-Rashid, three of them were assassinated. And not to say anything about the other, uh, the other monarch in Islamic history that probably the majority of them died, killed instead of dying naturally. It's a very risky business. This is one of the great failure in Islamic culture. Muslim scholars did not have, or Muslims did not have written constitutions. The Prophet ﷺ has a written constitution in Medina. Yes, it's a simple constitution for a simple society, true. But at least he had the principle for us. Why didn't Khulafa al-Rashid have written constitution, or the Umayyad, or the Abbasid, or why we have to wait until 1876 uh, with the, the Ottoman have their first constitution at the time? I mean, 1244 years of Islamic history, no written constitution. It means since the state of Medina until the, the 19th century Ottoman Empire. This is a great failure in terms of procedure and institutions. And Muslims did not develop institutional constraint on the leader's decision. Yes, there are a lot of moralizing in our books of Nasaih al-Muluk, or what they call mirrors of prince. There are a lot of moralizing, there are a lot of good advices, but not legal constraint, something that can stop him if he doesn't want to. So preaching is not enough in politics. Politics is a, is a dirty game, actually. It's preaching only. It's not enough to change the political order. You need to have concrete legal and institutional limits that stop the ruler uh, and make him listen to his people. No sound regulations of the acquisition of political power or distribution of power in our, uh, in our legacy, in the intellectual legacy that we have from our classical scholars. They didn't say much about how legitimately a leader should acquire the position come to power. And when they do that, they do it in an adaptive way with the, with the Persian monarchism that I'll talk about. There is no detailed regulations on distribution of power. There are some talk about responsibility of the caliph, for example, or wazir tawfid, wazir tanvid, but it's not really enough. It's very poor c compared with the, what was needed. There is no detailed legislations of the relationship between rulers and rules. There are a lot of moral advices, but not legal and <coughs> institutional uh, limits. So, in, to summarize, Islamic political values stayed ethical and abstract rather than practical and legal. They were not translated into procedures and institutions. And that is a great failure in Islamic history. Why this happened? 
because there was tensions of values, tensions between conflicting values in that very complicated empire that we called the uh, Umayyad or Abbasid or Ottomans. Classical Muslim jurists gave priority to order and stability over justice and freedom. That was their priority, is stability, order. And we still have some scholars who are, even today, after we lost all kind of stability and all kind of unity and all kind of order, they are still preaching us to just obey your rulers and, and protect stability. This is what, uh, what John Locke called the piece of graveyard. So yeah, of course, the people in the graveyard are living in peace, but they are dead. <laughs> if you are alive, you don't, you don't want that kind of peace. Uh, so John Locke said that people who obey uh, dictators, yeah, they will have peace, but it's like a piece of graveyard. Islamic Political jurists adapted their theories and positions with the coercive power of this state, basically. They accepted Persian monarchism to save the Ummah from the Arabian anarchism. So there was the risk of Arabian anarchism that led to the death of three of Khulafa al Rashidin. Uh, that is not easy. It, it's there, it's, it's pressing on the, on the scholar consciousness and his mind. Uh, so he wants to save the Muslim empire or the Muslim state or community from that traditional Arabian anarchism. But in order to do that, he adapts his theories and position to the Persian monarchism. That, that, that was not the right solution. But within the circumstances, everything was possible. The adaptation of those scholars should not be taken as an Islamic genuine values and rules. Islamic political values should be taken from the text of Quran and Sunnah, not from the works of Maurdi or Bnutaymiya or Juwaini or other scholars, unless they prove they are compatible with the text. But we need to put their adaptation to coercive power within the context of time, space, and feasibility. There is a debate between some contemporary uh, historians of Islamic political thought, especially in the West, that was there some kind of Islamic Hobbesianism, you know, like before Hobbes was born, Muslims uh, came with these theories of Hobbes. Uh, I, I don't think so. There is something similar, but there is also a difference. And uh, uh, one of the scholars who analyzed this nicely is Andrew Marsh. In his, uh, in his article in the uh, Princeton Encyclopedia of Islamic Political Thought, and this is what he says. The Sunni position was not Hobbesian, might makes right, or absolutist. In fact, Though the Sunni scholars valued stability and legal order above all else, the state per se was not the highest object of loyalty. And the state has no monopoly on religious or moral interpretation. Both of these loyalty and religious interpretation belong to the community. The community and the practice of Islamic interpretation was essential, transcendent, necessary reality. The community was the essential, not the state. I mean, there is a big difference between a scholar who is scared of the dictator uh, and his justifying dictatorship because of that, and another scholar who is afraid for the community itself. He doesn't want the destruction of the community. So this one is different from that one, ethically at least. Yes, the result might be the same. Both of them will justify obeying dictators. but. This one is doing it because he wants to save the community, and the one is doing it because he wants to save himself from the dictator. My, at least most of Muslim scholars in the past 
were not actually justifying for the rulers because they were afraid of the rulers, but they were afraid about the future of the community. And in the uh, world of empire, this is, can be understood well because you are living in uh, what Hobbes called you know, the war of all against all. So it, it, practically you are in a permanent state of war. If there is any weakness or civil war within the Muslim community, Byzantium can invade or any other entity can invade. So the existence of the community is more important than the legitimacy of the leadership. That is the equation that those scholars, uh, because of this, accepted the monarchism and adapt to the Persian monarchism. Doesn't mean what they did was right, but uh, I mean, it's not, it's not compatible with Islamic principle in principle, but it was a temporary solution for the time, and we need to get out of that kind of solution today because we're really living in completely different context. So what do we need to do at the end of the day? I think we need to adapt, but we don't need to adapt. And there is a lot of talk to the, these days here in Kyle about creative and adaptive. I think there is a big difference between adopting an idea and making it your own after you read it with, by the parameters of your own beliefs and moral system and adapting to an alien idea that is not compatible at all with your worldview. So what we need to do, in my personal view, is we need to revive first our political values and free them from the burden of the interpretations within the empire context, the interpretations of those scholars who present to us within the empire context actually expire because we have no empire anymore and we don't live in a world of empires anymore. Uh, I think we need to be harsh to our past in order to save our future. Actually, I think mature people, or whether individual or communities, need to be harsh to their past in order to save their future. We don't have to glorify you know, the work of our scholars uh, in a way that prevents us from seeing their shortcomings and limitations of their ideas. We just need to read what they presented to us, what they left to us within the context of time, space, and feasibility. Siyaq al-Zaman, what I like to call in Arabic, Siyaq al-Zaman wal-Makan wal-Imkan. If we use the three, we can read. I don't have to blame him for accepting dictatorship in order to save the community, but I don't have to accept dictatorship today in order to save the community because we don't have community anymore anyway. <coughs> Sorry. We need to connect with the modern political values, with the, specifically with the democratic values that most of the humanity is adopting today. Salafi anachronism is a dead end, you know. The Salafis in general are enslaved by the historical image. And they look at also their obsession, they have some kind of obsession with anything coming from the West. For them has to be rejected regardless. Just it's enough to say, oh democracy is that's Western idea. If you say Western idea, it's like synonymous with wrong idea. No, that's not synonymous with wrong idea. It can be Western idea or Eastern idea. That's just descriptive. That's not a, a judgment. That's not logical or moral judgment on an idea just to say this is a Western idea. Uh, yeah, we need to read Western political values within the parameters of the Islamic revelation, no doubt. The same way that we have to read our own scholars' ideas also and judge them by the, this balance or this scale of revelation. Ishtihad, a political shihad today is a matter of life and death for Muslim societies, I think. And, but the main shihad effort that we need today should address the issues of institutions and procedures, because that is the point of weakness in our Islamic political legacy. It's not about values. <coughs> there is almost consensus among Muslims today about that right of people to choose their 
they are leaders and you know there is you no know, serious people who theorize uh, monarchy or military coups for example I mean serious people who have who have moral credential but the problem is not this it's not about core values anymore I think the problem has been and is still a poverty in institutions and procedures and that's what we need to address in our political ishtihad today adapting ishtihad of course is not enough creative and self affirmative uh, affirmative ishtihad is a must but we should remember while we are rejecting adaptation that there is a great space of overlapping values shared values between human beings between world religions and between world cultures and Islam and Islamic culture is not an exception in this regard we share a lot with the rest of humanity and the rest of humanity share a lot with us we don't have to emphasize the differences more than the commonalities I think that is uh, it's some kind of you know obsession with distinction that I want to be different regardless of I'm right or wrong and that's not really good uh, and I don't think also that's the Islamic uh, way what I'm gonna do with this Monte Carlo radio <laughs> calling me now <laughs> uh, if we look at prophetic tradition we see that Prophet emphasized the shared space and the shared beliefs and the shared values with other faiths and cultures for example Presenting himself in relation with previous prophet, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Mathali wa And then at the end of the hadith, Prophet Sallallahu said that my relation to other prophets like it's like someone who built, you know great palace but he left only one brick you know in the corner that is missing he said I am that brick he didn't present himself that he's destroying uh, the palace and the building from the beginning no he presented himself as one brick within this great palace that Allah create a long line of prophets from Adam to to Muhammad uh, this is in term of prophethood also in terms of ethics he said that I was sent only to perfect or to complete good manners he didn't say that humanity has nothing good in his time no he said that there are a lot of good things but I need to complete it with the message of God that only God is perfect so the message of God come to to perfect what a human have there is a lot of good in a human life there are a lot of good that a human intellect can can lead us to it but it, there is need for completion and perfection uh, and the prophet sallallahu alaihi praises praised this uh, christian uh, monarch or christian king of abyssinia when he told muslims to go to abyssinia and he said to Ethiopia that there is a Christian king that nobody is wronged in his or treated unjustly in his land and it's a land of truthfulness or land of sincerity so he didn't say no those are Christians though they cannot have anything good no he said go to that Christian monarch live there he's, he's just a ruler and his land is land of truthfulness uh, of course if we look at institution we find the flexibility of Prophet when he came to Medina and became a head of state in borrowing many things that will improve Muslims political and military performance the stamp for example Prophet tried to when he intended to send a letter to the uh, Caesar to the, to the king of Byzantium one of the one of his companions who's who's probably very familiar with 
with the uh, Syrian province of Byzantium. He told him, no, the, the Romans, and Muslims used to call Byzant Byzantine the Romans, the Romans do not read, the Roman king don't read any letter that is not stamped. And Prophet Sallallahu said, okay, let's have a stamp though. He made, he asked them to order them to make one for himself. Uh, the trench, Khandaq, in the battle of, of the trench, it's a, a Persian military tradition, never known in Arabia before. But because you have among the early Muslims, Salman al-Varisi, Salman the Persian, and he knew that the people of Mecca are coming to besiege Medina. He said, Ya Rasulullah, kunna idha husirna khandaqna. In Persia, when an army is coming to besiege us, we used to you know, dig this trench around the city to protect ourselves. Prophet Sallallahu adopted the idea immediately. <clears throat> when Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh, came, he was stunned with this, and you know, I said, uh, like, oh my God, this is a trick that uh, the Arabs never knew. Of course, because these are new Arabs who want to know, who want to learn from others. They are not the old uh, Arabs who feel themselves, you know, the center of the world and they don't need anybody, no. Muslims, Arab, Muslim Arabs in the time Prophet are people who want to learn from others. That's the difference between them and people of the pagans of Mecca. So adoption of ideas, institutions, and procedures is a must for the prosperity of any culture. Claude Levi Strauss has a famous saying that in an Arabic translation, in al ibda la yakunu illa ala al hudud bayn al thaqafat. That creativity happens only at the border, on the borders between cultures. So when a culture touches the other culture, then you have that spark of creativity. Uh, positive adoption is not synonym with negative adaptation. There's a difference between positive adoption and negative adaptation. Positive adoption actually translates your own self-esteem. You feel that you can take from others without any complex of inferiority or superiority. And you believe that the human wisdom is shared by all humans. I take, it's a, it's a give and take uh, equation. I give and I take from others. There is no problem in that. While negative adaptation is something else. It's, it's negative. So, what we need to do is to own what we adopt, not just borrow it. In uh, cultural history, you need to make your, the, the idea you borrow from others, you need to make it your own ideas. There is a process of giving it your own stamp, your own ethical, your own terminology. Uh, you know, there is some process of borrowing, not just borrowing the idea, but you need to put it within that process until you make it your own blood, like, like transferring blood from a person to another. The body will work on that blood. Uh, not just a strange body that the, the body will, uh, will fight. Uh, we need to stand on the shoulders of giant in order to see far away. You know, this Isaac Newton famous word, he said, I was able to see farther than others because I stood on the shoulders of giants means that he studied deeply the best literature that written by the greatest philosophers and writers, like as if he's standing on their shoulders, so he can see far away. So we need to also be selective on what we adopt in order to be creative, in order to see farther. We need to stand on the shoulders of giant, if we use the meta meta metaphor of Newton. And finally, be strong, create the environment. Back to my friend Iqbal, the powerful man creates environment. The feeble have to adjust themselves to it. Assalamu alaikum.
Thank you. Let's start with the, uh, Sheikh Shouki, two questions. Uh, what happened in Islamic history? Why Muslims adapt so easily to the Persian monarchism uh, in order to avoid Arabian anarchism? I think uh, the historical circumstances were very tough. Uh, when you look at Medina during Khulafa Rashidin time, you find this is the only place on earth for 30 years that, uh, in which people choose their leaders without not, not on a hereditary basis or on, on force. So uh, just like the same way the, 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 the democracy of Rome f uh, fall and fell in the same way the Athenian democracy fell, I think that the same way the uh, Medinan experience fell also because the, it was ahead of its time, if, we, if, if that is the right term in, in English. Uh, so uh, it, it is a, uh, isolated, uh, it, it's not, it was not compatible with the spirit of that time, which is monarchism was established, accepted. Um, and also, uh, of course, there are big structural problems. The lack of traditions of state and government laws in Arabia was a major uh, problem that caused the also contribute to the destruction of experience of Khulafa Rashid in Medina. And then there is a ready made model and activated, I always say that activated values can defeat inactivated values, even if they are lower in, in terms of morality or the al qiyam المفعلة تهزم القيم المعطلة. So yeah, you believe in shura, that's fine. Shura means you you elect your leader, that's fine, no problem. But if you don't activate it, someone else who have another notion of right of people to 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 elect their leaders, he has something concrete. He has a ready model, and people are attracted to something ready. People are. Uh, like something easy, you know, the easy solution that Malik ben Nabi talk about, you know, Ruhan uh, Suhula. Uh, I think, anyway, it's a, it's a long story of historical circumstances within Arabia and in the neighboring empire. The attraction of the empire model on the borders of Arabia and the, the, the political vacuum in Arabian culture, all of that combined <laughs> lead to the uh, destruction of that model and the adaptation to Persian monarchism. <clears throat> As for adapt and not uh, adapt, I think the, the main difference is processing. You borrow an idea, you process it, you make it your own, you judge it, uh, you edit it at least. Uh, it's not like you just take something. It, uh, probably the best metaphor is, is Plant, you know, you know, plant something in your body that will body accept it or not. There is need for some complicated. We have some doctors here who can explain that. I know about poetry more than medicine. Um, uh, as for accessibility, uh, Omar, accessibility of, to knowledge, this is a very important Islamic principle. And there is very strong hadith, Prophet you know uh, that uh, about about monopoly of of knowledge that no human being has the right to monopoly knowledge. Anybody who is asked about something he knows, uh, he has to give the right answer. That's why we have some some Muslim scholars who don't like this uh, today idea of intellectual right. I know Sheikh Sheikh Muhammad Amin Shinqiti who was a great scholar of tafsir. Uh, who wrote the book Adwa ul Bayan? He used to, to have a condition for the uh, publishers that don't put Hukuk al Tabah on my book, don't put, you know, or write reserve on my books. That's anybody who wants to publish the book, publish it. He said, I, I believe that's haram, don't do it. Because Professor Azim said, Man katama ilman, so as a moral principle, monopoly of knowledge is not acceptable in Islam. And also accessibility to the ruler 
himself or herself is is also Islamic principle. And that's the hijab عن الرعية. من ولي من أمر أمتي شيئا فاحتجب عن حاجتهم وخلتهم احتجب الله عن حاجته وخلته يوم القيامة. So uh, the ruler has no right to be disconnected from people. He has to give them the right to be uh, to to access. Uh, to the place where they can talk about their issues, their problems. Wallahu alam. But, you know, of course, we have to, to be realistic today that creation of knowledge has become a business, very expensive business, and people who invest in creating knowledge have the right also to get some return for what they spend. You don't expect a company that spent billions of dollars investing in something to just give it free for customers. At least they have the right to, to have reasonable profit and to take back their capital that, that they invested in that, in the creation of that kind of knowledge. Well, some of it is, uh, is ishtihad, some ad adaptation, of course. Uh, but all of them are more social, more than political ishtihad that I'm talking about is related to to uh, building authority and distribution of authority I mean, <coughs> at this moment. Uh, but you're right, in, in, well, in terms of constitution, written constitution, yeah, there are some you know, attempts here and there that mm, Muslim knew, some of them Islamic, some are not. Uh, looks like it started with the laws of the Mongols when they invaded Islamic world, they have this Yasha law. And then in the, the Mamluks of Egypt also, they try some rudimentary documents. But I don't think it cannot be called constitution in the technical meaning. But I still think that, 19, that uh, 19, uh, the 1867 is, is uh, probably the beginning of developed creating constitution that's talking about distribution of power and the different branches, government and something. Is that because of the Western, is it a Western idea, Western pressure? I don't, I don't mind Western pressure. I wish the West, Westerners press us to be more democratic and have less dictatorship. I don't mind that kind of pressure. Uh, uh, but actually, I don't think that the Ottoman Empire did that because of the Western pressure they did, because also they wanted to save their aging and dying empire that is not up to date anymore. And I, I'd like to read for you a text here from Al-Kittani in his book, Taratib al-Idariya, which is one of the greatest book on Islamic uh, institution, political institution. It's about political institution in the time of Prophet <clears throat> but commenting on the issue of trench and how the Prophet ﷺ borrowed the idea of stamp from the Roman tradition, Byzantine tradition, and the trench from the Sasanid tradition, Kitani commented on that and he said, ذلك أعظم الدلالة على أن الممالك والدول التي لا تنسج على منوال مجاوريها فيما يتخذونه من الآلات الحربية والتراتيب العسكرية والنظامات العلمية والعملية الصناعية والزراعية يوشك أن تكون غنيمة لهم ولو بعد حين. Saying basically that if you don't borrow from your neighbors and uh, adopt some of the advanced techniques they have, whether it's scientific or military or politics, you will be victim of those neighbors. I mean, if you want to catch up with your enemy, you need to learn from your enemy. If you want to catch up with your neighbor, you need to learn from your neighbor. Don't say, this is my enemy, I don't like him, so I will not learn anything from him. No, that, I think, arrogance. Students need to be humble, and the teacher need to be sincere in his teaching. The problem today in between Islamic world and the West is that student is not humble enough and the teacher is not sincere enough also to give his best. So it's a very complicated process of education. The teacher doesn't want to give you his best. 
he wants to sell you arms, but he doesn't want to give you freedom, for example, or human rights. Uh, and the, the student, which is the Muslim, is, uh, is uh, uh, abusing and insulting the teacher every day in the morning in the classroom. So uh, he wants to learn. So there is a need to, I think, for a new kind of uh, more positive relation for the benefit of all. Thank you. Great question. That's fundamentals of political philosophy. Good agenda for the afternoon. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have time, hopefully, to address this very important and very fundamental uh, questions. But I think it's not, we don't have time anymore for that now. We have four minutes. Well, I'm sure he didn't create a state just by chance. That's what I can say now. But hopefully, in the afternoon, we will. Uh, I will have more energy to, uh, to talk about this because this is a very important issue actually. The agenda is creating uh, many things through a human effort also and the human responsibility. Uh, as for the uh, that uh, in Western society sometimes they are afraid that Muslims can change the way of life I, I don't think, I think that's just an exaggeration because, again, like some Muslims who don't see the common space and the shared values, there are many Westerners who don't see the common space and the shared values with Islam and with, uh, with Muslims. So if we emphasize on what is common and what is shared, that will solve a lot of problems and fear. And I believe Islam didn't come to destroy, Islam came to build and didn't present itself as, a, uh, as an alternative to existing orders or existing religion, but, to, but as a perfection of the existing order and existing religion. So Muslims can contribute positively without destroying anything positive. In Western, in the Western way of life. Thanks.